United States Expansion, 1800 to 1860. When Thomas Jefferson became president in 1801, the Mississippi formed the western boundary of the United States. By 1860, when Abraham Lincoln was elected president, the nation stretched across the continent to the Pacific. Keep in mind, Thomas Jefferson was the third president of our United States. Abraham Lincoln was our 16th president. This expansion brought Americans great new sources of wealth and opportunity, but placed the South deeply at odds with the North over whether to permit slavery in Western territories. The first great step in American expansion occurred in 1803, when Thomas Jefferson concluded the Louisiana Purchase. For $15 billion, the United States obtained from France its claim to the Louisiana Territory, including New Orleans, and everything west of the Mississippi up to the headwaters of its tributaries in the Rocky Mountains. Purchasing this enormous claim was one thing. Taking possession of it was another. Americans heading west would have to reckon with the tribes that lived there and with com competition from Britain and Spain, which had returned Louisiana to France in 1800 on condition that it not be transferred to a third party. In 1804, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark left St. Louis and headed up the Missouri River. That expedition would take them to the source of that river in Montana, onto the Pacific, and back. Their dealings with Western Indians, who did not yet regard whites as threats to their territory, were largely peaceful. Sacagawea, a woman of the Shoshone tribe, served as a guide for Lewis and Clark, who returned to St. Louis in 1806 after charting a path that would soon be followed by trappers and fur traders. That same year, Zebulon Pike explored the Arkansas River to its source in the Rockies. In 1807, he was captured by Spanish, Spanish troops and held prisoner for several months, a reminder that much of the West remained disputed territory. Tensions lingered between the United States and Spain, but the great challenge to American expansion came from Spain's ally Britain. Settlers in the Ohio Valley blamed British officials in Canada for encouraging Tecumseh, a Shawnee chief who organized resistance to American encroachment. Resentment flared when the British boarded American ships to seize sailors as they claimed were deserters and preventers and prevented Americans from trading with Europe, now largely under the control of Britain's enemy, Napoleon. In 1812, the United States declared war on Britain. Fighting raged on several fronts. On Lake Erie, Oliver Perry bested a British fleet in 1813 clearing the way for United States forces at Detroit to cross into Canada, where they killed Tecumseh. The British struck back in 1814 with a raid on Washington, D.C. that left the nation's capital in flames. In the South, Andrew Jackson crushed an uprising by Creek Indians inspired by Tecumseh, occupied Spanish Florida, and defeated British forces in the Battle of New Orleans in January 1815, before either side learned that a peace treaty had been signed earlier. The war was essentially a draw for the United States and Britain, but it was a huge setback for tribes resisting white settlement west of the Appalachians. Settlers urged westward by river and trail, and work began on the Erie Canal linking the Hudson River with Lake Erie. The Midwest was settled largely by northerners favoring free labor, while the states below the Ohio River were settled mostly by southerners in favor of slavery. By 1819, there were 11 free states and 11 slave states. The balance of power in Congress and the future of slavery depended on how that issue was resolved in the states that would take shape west of the Mississippi. In 1819, with 11 free states and 11 slave states, Missouri applied for admission to the Union as a slave state, setting off a heated debate. Congress, that led Congress... Uh, to the Missouri Compromise of 1820. It maintained the political balance by admitting Maine as a free state to offset Missouri and by prohibiting slavery in territory north and west of Missouri while leaving territory to the south open to slavery. Arkansas, for example, was admitted as a slave state in 1836, while Iowa entered the Union as a free state 10 years later. Most Americans welcomed this compromise. Their main concern was not freedom for blacks, but opportunity for whites, including those denied the right to vote because they did not own property or pay taxes. Settlers who went west seeking a fresh start resented such restrictions, and states beyond the Appalachians were the first to give all adult white males the right to vote. Champion of this movement 
was the war hero Andrew Jackson, who broke with the Republicans and ran for president in 1828 as a Democratic Republican or a Democrat. Elected with strong support from the South and West, Jackson pleased voters by, there by forcing the removal of Indian Territory, present-day Oklahoma, of the Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, and Cherokee, many of which had settled as farmers on land guaranteed them by treaty but coveted by white settlers. In 1835, after most Cherokee refused to accept a new treaty confiscating their territory in Georgia, Jackson sent federal troops to oust them. Thousands died before they reached Indian Territory on a journey remembered as the Trail of Tears. During Jackson's second term in office, American settlers in Texas joined in a rebellion against Mexico. In April 1836, a month after suffering a crushing defeat at the Alamo in San Antonio, rebels won a victory at San Jacinto and captured Mexican President Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna. He agreed under duress to recognize their independence, a concession later rejected by Mexico. Jackson did not seek statehood for Texas because slavery was legal there, and he did not want to reopen that issue. Mexico maintained its claim to Texas and opposed its annexation by the United States. Other developments in the 1840s contributed to border tensions in the West. Immigrants were heading west in wagon trains to settle in the Oregon Territory, disputed between the United States and Britain. That issue was resolved by a treaty that set the boundary with Canada at the 49th parallel, but differences between the United States and Mexico defied resolution. Since 1821, United States merchants had been traveling from Missouri to New Mexico on the Santa Fe Trail and gaining wealth and influence there. Other Americans were infiltrating Mexican California by land and by sea. Expansionists argued that it was the nation's manifest destiny to rule the continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific, regardless of Mexico's claims. Tensions between the United States and Mexico escalated in 1845 when President James Polk of Tennessee, a fervent expansionist, won approval from Congress for the annexation of Texas. The United States and Mexican troops clashed along the border there in early 1846 and the United States declared war in May. The su that summer, Stephen Kearney led troops down the Santa Fe Trail and occupied New Mexico, then continued to California to help the United States Navy and volunteers under John Fremont crush Mexican resistance there. To force Mexico to accept those American gains, Polk sent an army under Winfield Scott to Mexico City. It was captured in September of 1847 after hard fighting. Critics feared Polk would annex all of Mexico and establish slavery there, but the peace treaty in 1848 kept Mexico intact below the Rio Grande while ceding to the United States and New Mexico, including what is now Arizona, California, and other territory in the Southwest. The war paid immediate dividends for the United States when gold was discovered in California in 1848. At the same time, the latest territorial gains renewed the, debate, renewed the debate over slavery. The Compromise of 1850 admitted California as a free state, but allowed for popular sovereignty in New Mexico and Utah, meaning that the inhabitants could legalize slavery if they chose. Popular sovereignty unleashed a firestorm when applied in 1854 to the newly formed Kansas Territory. There, there pro-slavery factions clashed with militant abolitionists such as John Brown. In 1859, he seized the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, in a failed effort to ignite a slave uprising. Brown's rebellion, which raised the controversy over slavery to fever pitch, was ended by an officer from Virginia named Robert E. Lee. Two years later, would resign from the United States Army to command troops for the newly formed Confederate States of America. <clears throat> the Civil War, 1860 to 1877. By 1860, the debate over slavery in the United States had driven a wedge between North and South and threatened to divide the Union. Most Northern states were not abolitionists, but they deeply resented efforts by Southern states 
to extend slavery to Kansas and other Western territories. The West, they believed, should be reserved for independent farmers and other free laborers. Southerners feared not only the growing e economic power of the North, but also its expanding political power as more Western territories entered the Union as free states. Southerners worried that Northerners in Congress would abolish slavery and destroy their economy, which depended heavily on cotton plantations worked by slaves. Abraham Lincoln, in 1858, insisted that the issue of slavery was beyond compromise and had to be settled. Quote, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the House to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. And so... Uh, the debate over slavery realigned the nation's political parties and produced a divisive presidential election in 1860. The Republican Party, formed in 1854 in opposition to slavery in the Western Territories, nominated Abraham Lincoln of Illinois, best known for his debates in 1858 with Democratic Senator Stephen Douglas, who favored popularity, sovereignty, or letting inhabitants of the Western Territories decide the issue of slavery themselves. That idea was opposed both by Republicans and by pro-slavery Democrats, who broke with their party when it nominated Douglas for president in 1860. The split among Democrats enabled Lincoln to win the election. Between then and his inauguration in March of 1861, seven states in the Deep South seceded from the Union and formed the Confederate States of America. Lincoln entered office facing a crisis in South Carolina where se secessionists were seeking the surrender of Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Unwilling to be seen as the aggressor, he announced that he would supply federal troops there provisions, but not ammunition or reinforcements. His stand left the fort vulnerable, but placed the burden of beginning hostilities on the Confederates. On April the 12th, they opened fire on Fort Sumter, which fell two days later. In the war that followed, northern states rallied behind the Union. It also retained the border states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas joined the Confederacy, led by President Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. Early in the war, the Confederates held the advantage. They were fighting on their own soil and led by gifted generals, notably Robert E. Lee and Thomas, Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Both were from Virginia, the setting for grueling campaigns conducted between the Confederate capital of Richmond and the federal capital of Washington, District of Columbia. Tennessee was hotly contested as Confederates tried to prevent Federals from penetrating the Deep South and capturing such strongholds as Vicksburg, Mississippi, and Atlanta, Georgia. The war's first major battle was fought in July of 1861 at Bull Run near Manassas, Virginia, where Confederates repulsed Federal troops. Stung by the defeat, Lincoln appointed George McClellan to strengthen the Union Army in 1862, McClellan advanced on Richmond, Virginia, but was repulsed by Lee. Mc, McClellan and Lee met again in a fierce battle at Antietam on September 17th. The war's bloodiest day, it left 23,000 men killed or wounded. Lee's army avoided disaster when troops under Stonewall Jackson rushed to the battle and held the Federals off, enabling the Confederates to withdraw. When McClellan failed to pursue Lee, Lincoln relieved him of command. On September 22nd, Lincoln announced plans to free slaves in the Confederacy. The Emancipation Proclamation, signed on the 1st of January, 1863, did not affect the border states and could not be enforced in parts of the South under Confederate control, but it helped transform the war into a crusade against slavery. Blacks enrolled in the Union Army in large numbers. The Emancipation Proclamation discouraged Britain, which had abolished slavery throughout its empire from siding with the Confederacy, the source of much of the cotton used in British textile plants. In 1863, Robert E. Lee regained momentum in Virginia by winning the Battle of Chancellorsville. He advanced until Pennsylvania, seeking a decisive confrontation with new federal commander George Meade. The two sides met at Gettysburg on the July 1st and clashed for three days in a battle that marked the Confederate high tide. Lee and his forces retreated in, into Virginia, where they would spend the rest of the war on the defensive. 
Meanwhile, Federal Commander Ulius S. Grant captured Vicksburg and took control of the Mississippi on the 4th of July, 1863. In 1864, he led a climatic drive on Richmond while William Tecumseh Sherman crushed Confederate resistance in the Deep South by capturing Atlanta and marching through Georgia to the sea. Confederates no longer had the resources or manpower to compete with the Federals. Both sides had insisted or instituted unpopular drafts that allowed men to purchase substitutes to fight in their place. Draft riots in New York City in 1863 shook the Union, but support for the war effort was reaffirmed, reaffirmed in 1864 when President Lincoln defeated the Democratic nominee George McKellen. By the spring of 1865, Grant had Richmond surrounded. On April 9th, Lee surrendered at a, at a pot of a pot a pot a pot a pot a pot courthouse, igniting celebrations in the North that ended with the news of Lincoln's assassination on April 14th. Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, disputed radicals who controlled Congress and sought to reconstruct the South by extending civil rights to blacks and keeping other, keeping former Confederates from regaining power. Radicals went beyond the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in 1865, and enacted the 14th and 15th Amendments, whose those born, which declared that all those born in, in the United States as citizens entitled to equal protection under law and stated that no one could be denied the right to vote based on race or previous condition of servitude. They imposed military rule in the South to ensure that blacks could res register to vote while whites who had actively opposed the Union could not. This led to the election of black representatives to Congress and angered many whites contributing to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and other racist groups. Radicals accused Johnson, who favored a more moderate approach to Reconstruction, of undermining their program and passing a law in 1867 stating that the president could not remove appointees without Senate approval. Johnson challenged them by dismissing Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, a favorite of the radicals. Congress impeached Johnson but failed to win enough votes in the Senate to convict him. In 1868, Republicans tried to end controversy by nominating war hero Ulysses Grant. During his two terms as president, most whites who had backed the Confederacy regained the right to vote. Grant tried to protect the rights of blacks, but black Republicans and their white supporters in the South were fast losing power to white Democrats. Reconstruction ended after the presidential race in 1876, ended in a deadlock with several states disputed. Republican Rutherford B. Hayes was declared the winner, but only after negotiations in which he pledged to withdraw troops from the South and make other concessions. Southern states soon imposed voting restrictions that disenfranchised most blacks.